Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I see people are starting to get on. Um, we're going to give it just a minute or two before we start so folks can log on, do a Zoom update if they need to do so, haven't done so on their home computers in a while. Um, and then we'll get started with introductions and everything else. So thanks again for joining us. I also want to take the time to let folks know that we are recording this webinar tonight. Um, so you don't have to take notes right now if you don't want to, but definitely do so if you feel inclined. Um, but we will have this available on our YouTube channel um, later on. So we'll send you that link afterwards. But just so you know, it'll be recorded. Thanks. All right, we're going to get ready to begin. Thanks for going through that little technical difficulty with me. It looks like the slides weren't all the way showing. Um, so you are joining us tonight for a Streamside Landowner Workshop. And we have Adam Jackson here from Snowwich County, along with Rob Plotkoff, and then Thomas Bultice from Snowwich Conservation District, as well as myself, Sarah Rosero. I will be your host tonight. And I've been with the district for a couple years. I am a community engagement coordinator there. So I get to do lots of awesome workshops where I get to interact with people, be in person when that was a thing before COVID. And just really excited to be here with you all tonight and to enjoy some great information, learning about what you can and can do along a waterway. So if you're unfamiliar with Snohomish Conservation District, we offer a variety of services. So it's free technical assistance um, and sometimes financial assistance through grant funding to man land managers throughout Snohomish County and Camino Islands. Um, we do everything from agriculture to youth education and everything in between. If you have drainage problems on your property, we can come out and help. Um, and lots of habitat restoration and repair and work, which you'll hear about a little bit today. And then with Snohomish County, we have Adam Jackson, who will share a little bit what the county has to offer. Adam, you're muted, sorry. You think after two years of doing this, I'd have that down. Okay, let's try this again. My name is Adam Jackson. I work for Snohomish County Surface Water Management. Uh, surface Water Management, or SWIM as we refer to it as, is the division uh, in Snohomish County under the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, which is actually a newly formed department with the county, but SWIM has been around for uh, at least 30 years, and we are the uh, county's stormwater utility. So SWIM's work is to keep people safe and waters healthy. We provide essential services to Snohomish County residents. We're here to partner with the community and help reduce impacts of flooding and to protect and enhance water resources for current and future generations. Uh, SWIM does this by uh, four primary categories, working on monitoring and improving water quality in Snohomish County, uh, improving salmon and marine habitat, 
drainage, uh, addressing drainage and road flooding, and also addressing and uh, mitigating river flooding. Perfect. Thank you so much, Adam. So just some, some housekeeping today. Um, please see this little red circle at the bottom if you have any questions right in the Q&A box. If you have any technical questions for me, um, you can do that soon in the chat. And please look out and, you know, early next week, we'll be sending out an email, an email with some follow-up resources and a survey so you can tell us how we did. Um, tonight, we have three presenters, really lucky to have uh, Adam and Rob and Thomas with us tonight. So Adam Jackson works with Snohomish County Service Water Management. We call it SWIM for short, so please forgive me if I just refer to SWIM. Um, but Adam is a watershed steward and he's a men member of the planning group with Surface Water Management. Adam joined the county in 2017 and has been his current role ever since. Adam is able to provide uh, landowners with a variety of resources, including technical assistance uh, to understand, protect, enhance natural resources. In addition to that, Adam provides, um, he provides support to several programs, which is Lakewise, drainage and culvert issues, and then floodplain services programs. Um, prior to Snohomish County, he spent time working at the Washington Conservation Corps and 10 years working at King Conservation District on their riparian enhancement and volunteer programs. Um, Adam enjoys time outside, like us all in this type of work, I would hope so. Um, and he does that with his wife, son, and two dogs. And next, we will have Rob, who is also joining us from Snohomish County, and he's a senior habitat scientist and has been doing so since also 2017 in his current role. Um, during lo Rob's long career, he's done things such as um, fisheries, ecology, toxology, water assessments. He has done a lot of scientific work in large rivers, reservoirs, streams, and lakes for over 33 years, which is amazing. So we're really excited to learn about Rob and his um, stream ecology knowledge sharing with us today. And then lastly, we have Thomas Boltice with Snohomish Conservation District. So there, uh, Thomas has been with us since 2019 and he is a restoration project coordinator. So Thomas will manage a lot of our projects, um, riparian buffers, wetland projects with the county, and he also manages our Washington conservation crew. And so some of Thomas's background is that he has a master's in environmental resource management and has also been on the Washington conservation crew um, as in, IP and done field crew implementing riparian restoration projects and managing noxious, noxious weeds. So we're really excited to have them all speaking with us tonight and sharing some information. Um, we want to do some acknowledgement to funders. So without this funding, this webinar would not be possible. Um, this funding will also allow Thomas and Adam to um, implement some riparian restoration work in certain watersheds. So please reach out if that's something you're interested in. And then we just want to say thank you for joining us. And I'm going to stop sharing. And then Thomas is going to share his screen and get things started. Uh, so please let me know if you have any further questions. And I will pass it off to Thomas. Thank you all. Are we um, seeing my screen here? We see the end of slideshow and it says click to exit. Okay, how are we doing now? Perfect, at the Thank beginning. you everyone. And thank you for the introduction, Sarah. Um, the four of us are very uh, excited to have everyone here. We really are eager to take advantage of these opportunities when we can interact with um, streamside landowners, people living in our watersheds and um, really making making that contact, providing resources, and maybe continuing a partnership into the future. Um, so if that's something that um, by the end of this presentation you have questions or you want to interact more, uh, we invite you to do so. Um, you will see our contact information below. 
um, at the end of the presentation. And that is um, an open invitation to uh, contact us with questions and concerns you have on your property and how uh, our resources uh, can possibly help you. Um, so we want to focus on um, how can you be a stream friendly landowner? Um, how can you live on your property and with a stream and interact with your property in a, in a healthy way and understand how that's working and what part of the greater system in our watersheds uh, you are a part of. Um, so today we're gonna go over some um, hydrology and morphology of streams. Um, we're gonna move with Rob to stream ecology um, and talk about the, the community that we live with in our watersheds. Um, Adam's gonna talk about living with beavers um, and how we manage our relationship with these uh, you know, uh, engineers in our watersheds. Um, we're gonna talk about some impacts to the streams, um, how uh, there's a threshold where these become uh, negative impacts to our watersheds and how we might manage those um, with riparian restoration and why uh, putting native plants along our streams is a very important thing to do. Um, lastly, we're gonna talk about how uh, we can work in streams um, and what are the regulations there. And so Adam's going to introduce some of those um, some of those activities that we want to pay attention to um, that might need a permit and those things that you can do without a permit and how you can interact with uh, the actual water flowing through your property. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about how you can get support if um, what you hear today is just opening a door and you want to know more or you want to do work on your property. Um, we are gonna talk about a few organizations that you can uh, get in touch with to pursue paths into managing the stream on your property. So a watershed um, is something that um, is part of everywhere that we live. We are always within a watershed boundary um, and the boundary of that watershed um, is usually a high point and everywhere within that watershed is flowing to um, a focal point. So. You can picture our big rivers that you see in this slide, and um, the Skykomish, Snohomish, Stillaguamish. Um, they are they are kind of the bottom of these troughs that are gathering um, water throughout all of the land area and focusing it into the rivers. And then all of our, our rivers go out into Puget Sound from Snohomish County. Um, so this is a good uh, image here to show um, the divisions of our watersheds and just how big they are, how all these little streams or rivers that we live on are focusing into these larger rivers that are pushed right into Puget Sound. Um, and so it's important to understand that this is all connected and everything um, flows downstream into Puget Sound. And so we all have a little impact um, that we can make uh, positive and negative. And so we wanna uh, help you through the process of understanding what your impact is and why it's important. So stream morphology and hydrology. Um, these are questions um, that come up when we talk about morphology or what, what does the stream look like? What is the shape of it? And then hydrology is uh, where is the water? How much of is it? How much is there? Where does it go? Um, and, and for how long does it move? How much is there? So um, we want to know uh, how water is moving across our landscape. Um, and we care because uh, as you know, we have seasonal patterns um, that move water from the mountains all the way to the sound. And it's like a conveyor belt for nutrients, for pollution, for habitat. Um, and everything that is connected through this water is, um, is, is shown through a, a watershed based on the timing of um, when water moves. And so uh, as we go through, we're gonna to start to understand that the wet winters and the dry summers have a very uh, important impact to the watersheds uh, that we live in. Oh, I apologize for that. Great, so where does our water come from? Um, our water, as you know, mostly comes from precipitation. Um, that's where our, uh, when we get floods, it usually is associated with a big rain event. Um, and it's coming from our mountains um, and, and moving through our watersheds um, and all the way out through Puget Sound. So as it funnels through the watershed, um, we see a lot of different changes in the way our streams look, their size and their shape are changing and how much water is moving through them is changing as well. So here we have an image of, um, obviously these look just like streams and you've all seen streams and rivers that are shaped like this. 
Um, I want to note that the bottom stream is very straight, um, and this is more characteristic of, uh, of steep slopes um, in our mountains and water is moving very fast and there's a lot of constraints and geology that keeps it from moving around very much. But as we move into our, our floodplains and we have low gradients, we get a lot of movement from the river. Um, and this allows the river to, to carve its own path. And I think you all have seen uh, the river trying to move and your streams trying to move and the erosion you see from year to year. So as there's a low gradient, uh, the river likes to interact with its floodplain. It likes to um, carve its own path and, and rivers will always take um, the path of least resistance. Um, so they will move and continue to move based on where it's easiest to move through. So here we have kind of a busy picture and I wanna start um, deconstructing this so that you can understand what's going on. Um, first note that north is actually to the right of the picture. And so we want to um, orient ourselves that north is facing to the right. Uh, we are looking at the still Guamish confluence where the city of Arlington at highway nine is up to the left of your screen. And then we have the South Fork of the still Guamish river coming in. Um, and confluencing with the North Fork um, to make the main stem which flows out to Port Susan in the Puget Sound. Now, the reason that this photo is very um, characteristic of our rivers is because you see a lot of movement, you see a lot of gravel bars and side channels, and you also see a lot of different land uses. Um, so the city of Arlington has a lot of impact on a lot of the flow of rainwater coming in. Um, impervious services are funneling rainwater straight into the river. And that has a, a unique impact compared to um, at the bottom of your screen, you see a lot of passive land use and some agriculture. Um, and this changes the way that uh, rivers want to flow. It allows the, the South Fork to start moving and create these large and complex uh, channels and, and gravel bars here. Um, also notice that the North Fork is very straight in this section on the right side of your screen. The North Fork of the Still Guamish here is, is constrained and we're preventing it a little bit from moving because we have a lot of infrastructure, we have a lot of development that we want to control the river from moving. So this photo will come up again, and I want you to pay attention to how these rivers are moving and the shape that they're taking here. And we'll look at it again to see uh, where these rivers might have been in the past and where they might be moving in the future. And as they move, um, you are all familiar with our seasonality um, and when we get a lot of rain in the winter and less in the summer. And so one of the ways we visualize this is with a hydrograph, um, which is measuring how much water is moving through the watershed and moving through our rivers at one time. Um, and so I wanna note that um, over time, which is our bottom axis here, um, we have a certain amount of water moving. And the distinction in this graph is between urban and rural. So if you picture the city of Arlington with a lot of these road services where it doesn't allow the, the water to infiltrate, we get all this water moving straight into our storm drains and straight into the rivers. And so we get a lot of discharge really fast in our rivers. This is contrasted with uh, maybe a forested, uh, a forest dominated watershed where uh, the water takes a long time to move through the trees, through the ground cover, um, and through the soils, move through the water table until it finally reaches our streams and rivers. And so the time it takes for it to be discharged is longer and we get less uh, discharge at any given time. Um, and it's kind of extended over, um, over time. And so this is uh, one way where we see high flood events when we have a lot of urbanization and increase in impervious services. Um, and we also, um, we see uh, a, a reduction of this if we have more trees, more wetlands and more um, undeveloped land. So this is the same hydrograph uh, concept, um, but with actual data from this uh, still Guamish confluence um, area. And what we're uh, looking at is two different uh, data years. One is in 2015 and one is 2019 and 2020. Um, and if you remember 2015, we had a very dry, very dry season. And uh, this is um, shown by from March all the way to September, we see a constant decline um, of discharge. Whereas in 2019 and 2020, we don't get that de decline of discharge until maybe, you know, the end of May and in June, um, where we were, we were getting more rain. 
And so this is showing how much water is available. And this is really showing the drought in the summertime where the discharge in our river starts declining quite a bit. So now we have um, a little bit of morphology here where we can see on the outside bend of this stream, we have what's called a cut bank. And this is where most of the action of the stream is, is pushing. And on the inside bank, there's less energy. And so we're starting to deposit uh, a different, a lot of uh, sediments and gravel. And so you'll see that um, in a lot of different streams. And so if we look at an aerial view, you'll see in kind of the pink color, we have um, the gravel bars forming and then the red lines show the cut banks. And over time, the river will push on these cut banks and move out and it'll start changing shape so that further, um, Further along in time, we have uh, larger bends and a lot more erosion. So here is that same um, aerial photograph of the Still Glamish Confluence. This time north is pointing up and true north is up. So we have the north fork coming in and the south fork coming in below it. And then the main stem of the Still Glamish River is flowing out to Puget Sound. Now I want you to look at this and find a point on this photo because when I switch it, um, we're going to have a different type of imagery that's going to show us a little bit of where um, the river used to be. Um, so now if you're looking at the river, if we look at um, what we call LIDAR imagery, we can see the contours of the actual ground. And I just want you to notice um, where the river is moving and all these little remnant channels that have been snaking through what is now agriculture. Um, the river likes to move and it's been moving for a long time. And this is a, a good representation of that. Um, and now I think we'll pass it to Rob and he can uh, talk to us about stream ecology and um, how that affects um, and our watersheds and, and why that's important. Thank you, Thomas. Um, yes, the stream ecology component of this presentation includes a variety of important characteristics. Um, those including the riparian zone. So in other words, vegetation along the stream side, um, that vegetation and its, um, its condition will also mediate the type of nutrients or energy that goes into the stream. And then we'll look at, at some of the species in the stream and that live um, on the stream banks as well and how they all interact. In order to begin, we acknowledge, as Thomas was pointing out, um, the complexity of a drainage. These things are really large in some cases. So we have small streams, we have medium-sized streams, and then we have the larger main stem um, that you really can't walk across. And so each though we expect to have different characteristics. For example, the upper end of this river continuum, or in other words, the headwaters, um, usually, or we expect to be um, covered by a lot of the streamside vegetation or riparian zone. And so there's a lot of shading that goes on in that portion of the stream. And then also water temperatures are protected, so they're cooler. Uh, as we progress down the stream toward the bottom of this image, you see the stream gets wider and effective shading from that streamside vegetation becomes less and less until you get to the larger stream where only the margins of the large river are protected by the shade. The other change that occurs and is significant is the substrate. Substrate tends to be coarser, so larger uh, uh, substrate sizes in the headwaters down through the middle portion. And then we get finer sediments like sand and silt in the, and, and this mediates and controls the type of um, aquatic life that likes to live there as well and make a living. First, the riparian zone. So the basic characteristics of the riparian zone or streamside vegetation are what you see here. It's uh, they, they generally vary in width. Um, the thicker or more distant the riparian vegetation is from the stream, the more effective it is in maintaining the low temperatures. Um, Streamside vegetation contributes leaves, sticks, and twigs. And these things I'll explain in a later slide how important they are and how they're used by aquatic life and transfer that energy up the food chain. 
Um, those are the nutrients that begin with this whole process, but they also serve as barriers to pollutants. And um, that's why they're terribly important to have because they do soak up some of the pollutants from the surrounding watershed and development. Um, and they also can just um, inhibit the flow of water directly to the stream. In an example of an intact versus a, a riparian zone versus one that isn't completely developed, on the right hand side, we see how streamside vegetation is hanging over top of the stream. There's more shading. Um, that leaf litter that you see will eventually fall into the stream and become an energy source for aquatic animals. Um, this, the, the um, stream photo on the right is upstream of that location that you see on the left, where you see one of the banks has intact riparian vegetation and the other does not. One of the um, effects when we lose one side of stream vegetation is we see invasive species starting to move in like reed canary grass or yellow iris. These do not offer the same kind of food energy beneficial to aquatic life. I mentioned energy and the, the beginning and where that comes from. In the upper right of this diagram, this seems like a real mess, but it's not as we just focus on piece by piece. But from the sunshine, you see that light directly um, influencing aquatic life, like the algae on the bottom of the stream and flowing straight downward. That's one source of energy. And that's one type of food that's taken advantage of by aquatic insects. The other type is growth of the streamside vegetation, the riparian vegetation, contribution of the leaves, as you see as we move left from the sunshine um, in this diagram. Those then, we'll, we'll focus on the leaves first. Those leaves are inhabited once they reach the stream by microorganisms or bacteria. You'll, you'll call them, I think they're also known as microbes. But what they do is they start um, absorbing and decaying the leaf matter, leaf sticks and twigs. So much so that invertebrates like that bug that you see to the lower left of the leaves start to chomp on, on them. One of the things that we realized uh, was the, the value of the leaf and the nutritive value doesn't come from the leaf material. Of course, that's good fiber and we all need that in our diet. But the nutritive value is con consumption of those microbes by that bug. Uh, just an aside, something that we learned about 20 years ago and um, a very important component to remember. Uh, a healthy microbial community is uh, beneficial to the food web. Then if we look back then at the algal component here, the algae, there are invertebrates below that that are scrapers. So they're on the rocks actively scraping up the algae and consuming that. That ends up being another food source. So all in all, um, as we progress to the lower left of this diagram, we'll see invertebrate predators that eat the scrapers. We'll see invertebrate collectors um, on the very lower middle portion of this diagram that take advantage of a lot of those fine particles. And then finally, uh, both juvenile fish will take the uh, greatest advantage of having a thriving invertebrate community is a juvenile fish that have a, a luxuriant food base. Um, of course, the adult fish eat both insects and smaller fish. One of the items that I mentioned that's an important component of stream ecosystems is nutrients. Um, you'll see here that oxygen, enough dissolved oxygen in the water column is important. Um, there needs to be nitrogen. Nitrogen is very abundant in the uh, aquatic environment, mostly because nitrogen is the largest component of gases in air, and there's exchange between air and water um, gases. And then also phosphorus can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. We'll see why. Also carbon, that's a component of all of that leaf litter, sticks and twigs that fall into the, uh, into the aquatic environment, of course, are an important part of both air breeders and water breeders' diets. 
One of the effects of nutrients might be, as you see on the left here, um, algal blooms that are, are, are very dense. Um, I think the biggest thing to note about algal blooms anymore is that um, when they get at certain species of algae become too abundant, they become what you've seen in the news uh, called harmful algal blooms or HABs. These can become toxic and they're neurotoxins. They affect animals, especially uh, domestic pets like dogs upon contact. Humans, not immediately, but can have some effects and um, neurotoxins are not anything to, to um, ignore. If we look to the right, I don't think I have to say any more. I think we have a very happy um, aquatic organism, the fish. One of the um, um, things that uh, we'll hear Thomas talk a little bit more about, and I'll try and give you a little bit more explanation, are the types of impacts that we always pay attention to in stream ecosystems. One of the big ones in our urbanizing environment is stormwater impacts. And they include um, some of the metals that were described back in the 1990s by a researcher named Nat Schultz uh, with NOAA Fisheries, the toxicology division. He found copper more so, and then zinc to a lesser extent, in effect, some of our salmonid species, in particular coho. Um, they weren't lethal at some of the thresholds that he described back then. But then uh, one of the other researchers that works uh, closely with Nat, Jen McIntyre from our Washington State University Stormwater Research Center in Puyallup, has recently, along with other researchers, have described how tire wear particles are, are um, causing uh, almost instant mortality in our coho salmon. Interestingly enough, the concentrations from these tire wear particles um, do not harm other species like the chum salmon. We're not seeing the same impact. But within 30 minutes, um, those salmon that um, come into contact with these lethal thresholds um, don't survive in any case, both juvenile and adult. Um, other components of uh, stormwater impacts include fine sediment from uh, runoff from nearby stream sides that don't have impact riparian vegetation or through direct conveyance um, by uh, stormwater pipes. Um, physical habitat impacts that are commonly known um, in a variety of land, land use settings are erosion of stream banks, those that leads to sediment transport to the stream, and then finally sedimentation in the stream. And we lose, among other things, uh, pools, which are really important um, uh, types of microhabitat where fish of various life stages like to live. Um, I had mentioned stormwater impacts, a typical um, stormwater pipe you see in the upper right. And unfortunately, the impact and the very immediate is what you see in the left side of this slide, that of coho salmon. When we think about unstable um, stream banks, and in fact, um, uh, Thomas had shown us a couple of examples there, but on a much larger river, this happens on smaller scales in, in medium-sized streams. You'll see to the left um, how when we lose the riparian zone, those that vegetation and mostly grasses and they're invasive in some cases, don't really maintain integrity of that soil. And those soils start to erode during high flows. And what we'll see then is what you see on the right is we'll see little piles of finer sediment that have grown in the center of the stream, um, on the stream banks. And we even see um, more of the fine particles in the main channel of the stream. And that completely changes the microhabitat. You don't see pools here for that reason. And it also changes the habitable substrate for aquatic insects. One of the, um, one of the earlier uh, phases of energy that's required uh, to move up the food chain and feed out of fish. Another interesting component, very natural, are beavers. Um, Adam will talk a little bit more about this after I finish uh, the stream ecology section, but here's one piece of a beaver dam that was breached. This, uh, the photograph on the left is below the beaver dam. 
make note of that stump straight through there because it's the same stump you see in the photo that says above dam. That's where all of the water was retained. And you see a little bit of fines there on the lower, on the lower uh, right-hand side of the upper, upper photo. You saw a bunch of fine sediment there, but when you look back at the lower left, you see a lot of that fine material has washed through. And so yes, there is some sediment transport from these. Um, in some cases with streams like this one, it's in a fully forested area, there's some good water energy that will transport that sediment and keep it from filling in pools, will keep it from um, um, smothering some of the very um, desirable types of habitat for aquatic insects. But one of the things that beaver dams do in, in mostly intact riparian areas is, is they, they conserve water, especially where um, water is maybe getting a little bit low uh, during the dry season. Thomas gave us an example of what a drought year looks like and what a, a wet year looks like with the uh, hydrograph that he had displayed. Now an introduction to animals in the stream. Um, there are a variety and, and the, the smallest ones are the plankton. These are the beginning of an energy source uh, for the macroinvertebrates. Uh, interesting are mussels and snails. I'll say a little bit about mussels and the remarkable characteristics about our populations. Um, amphibians, and then finally, of course, our salmonids. The smallest animals are less than half a millimeter in size. These um, are known as copepods. The one on the left is lovingly called cyclops. And the one on the right is a daphnid. These tend to be uh, real staples for earlier life stages of, um, of our, um, of our uh, food web. Um, and um, they're found in, in rivers and streams and lakes and reservoirs. They can be a, a very important component. The next level up, those that consume those Daphnia, those that consume the leaf litter and the algae are these, the aquatic invertebrates. Um, we have a variety of them. These are the most uh, charismatic of all of the species that we see in our rivers and streams here. In the upper left is a stonefly. Um, if we look in the lower left, that's another stonefly. The one in the upper left likes to eat other animals, so it's a predator. The stonefly in the lower left likes to eat leaves. Both of these are long-lived species. They are they they live in the streams for up to two years before they emerge. And all of these species here, you'll see caddis and mayflies. All of these are known as semi-aquatic, which means they begin their life in the water and then they emerge. And I'll show you the adult um, forms in a little bit, but. You know, the other uh, important thing to note here is, um, again, in the upper right is a, is a caddis fly, but it's a caseless caddis. It's a predator, very much like that stonefly in the upper left. And right below that turquoise blue caddis fly is a cased caddis, and that one likes to scrape algae from rocks. So everybody has a function in the aquatic environment, and they're performing it. When we have a variety of species that perform these functions, and we have a functioning ecosystem. The example for stonefly nymphs. Um, these, here's one where we have the uh, aquatic form on top and the adult form on the bottom. This is a predatory stonefly, and it is a, um, it is, it, it's one of the older invertebrates known uh, from an evolutionary perspective. The mayflies, um, the one that you see here is a scraper. You can see it's flattened versus some, somewhat, um, you know, um, a raise up off of the stone. So this one obviously likes to eat algae. Um, it's, it's adult phase is shown below. Interestingly enough, this particular group or this genus or species is a very, very old one. We know this, um, this example of a mayfly um, to be part of uh, the, uh, the uh, fossil record. Um, we have a dig up in Republic, Washington, the northeastern part of the state where 
the predecessor to this species has been found in the uh, stone. Uh, they're considered to be about 300,000 years old. So we call the older orders like um, the, um, the mayflies or the dragonflies, we call them nymphs versus larvae. And that's because the um, phases that they go through, they, they shed their skin while they're in the aquatic environment. They never metamorphose. They never close themselves up into a case. With the caddisfly, they do have cases and they do metamorphose. They actually change from their, their, their form in the aquatic phase and they develop into something com completely different looking. And this is why we call this a, a much newer lineage of species. Um, they actually include a pupa um, when they're in the aquatic environment, whereas the caddisflies and the stoneflies do not. The nymphs resemble the adults. Um, in this case here, you see on the right, you see net spinning caddisflies. So they're just filtering particles out of the water column and they end up eating all of that. Um, material may spin a new net. The more tolerant and more widely distributed aquatic insect species are these, the beetles, there's the water boatmen. You will see these mostly in, in still water. You'll find them mostly in much larger rivers and at the margins during the height of the summer. Um, same with the water striders, but they can tolerate low dissolved oxygen levels and uh, high water temperatures. Freshwater mussels are an important component and have increasing attention. Um, we can see here that there are a variety of sizes from the very tiny to the much larger. A healthy population will aggregate like we see to the right. These species live anywhere from 60 to over 100 years old if their populations are not impacted by uh, um, things like um, metals or, or um, fine sediment. And so these uh, have a very unique life strategy. Freshwater mussels are dependent on salmonid species. When the salmon and the other resident trout disappear, so do the mussels. They are required because the um, spawning uh, mussels release some of their early life stages called glochidia, those attached to the gill filaments of the salmon. And these glochidia are species specific. So when our salmonids disappear, so, does, so do the mussel populations. They let go after they live on the gill filaments of the salmonid species, and then they grow to much larger sizes in the substrate. Other um, types of aquatic life we pay attention to are very sensitive to alterations of our riparian and aquatic ecosystems are examples like the Pacific chorus frog or the red-legged frog. We also have the coastal giant salamander and cascade torrent salamander. Note the uh, coastal giant salamander is very good at hiding within the rocks on the side of the stream. And finally, the charismatic mega species in the aquatic environment. We see the five salmon species. You can see the uh, difference between the ocean and spawning phases here. And of course, the Chinook is the largest example of all of these salmon. Their life cycle is well known to most of us, beginning on the right middle portion with the egg, Alvin, in the um, spaces of, um, of uh, the substrate. Um, they emerge as fry and grow to become smolts, getting used to uh, the um, condition of the marine water. So as they are living in our estuaries, they finally are able to become ocean growing, return anywhere from one up to five years following their, their tenure in the ocean. The, um, the species that um, are managed here and are in various conditions as far as population conditions go, or, or in other words, numbers. Chum, pink, and sockeye seem to be doing fairly well in most places, but uh, one of the other species of concern is the coho salmon. Um, they are um, ubiquitous, meaning they're everywhere. We see them, but they don't always uh, 
have returns back from some of their native streams. The, um, the one of most concern and also we hear about is the impact as a food base to the uh, South, South, South Orca pods. Um, it's not just that, these larger salmon um, were distributed everywhere and they really do bring back a lot of needed nutrient to some of our rivers and streams, especially as we're losing um, energy sources. These bring back nutrients in terms of biomass and so their rotting bodies do feed um, invertebrates. We know of several midge species, we know of several um, uh, caddisfly species that actively feed on these as well as many other uh, terrestrial animals. And uh, some of this even finds, some of the marine derived nutrients finds its way into streamside vegetation. Others that are, are applying our waters are the cutthroat trout, uh, the bull trout, rainbow trout, the resident form, and of course the steelhead, the ocean gray form of the, uh, of the rainbow. And unfortunately, both the bull trout and steelhead are listed as threatened. And so these fish that are listed as threatened, the three that you, were, that you saw, actually have management plans um, and are real big drivers of how we view conserving, um, protecting, and restoring. Great. Thank you, Rob. That was uh, great information on stream ecology and all the critters that live there. Um, so I'm gonna uh, lead into beavers um, and their implication to streamside landowners and some of the benefits um, that they provide for our streams um, that their impacts might overshadow from time to time. So beaver activity and what do they do all day? Well, they actually do it all night since they're nocturnal. Um, the beaver is the largest uh, rodent in North America. It can get up to 45 pounds, but averages closer to 35, and they'll grow from three to four feet long. So beaver have a, a big impact on the ecosystems and our stream systems um, and wetlands that are associated and not associated with streams. Um, Beavers uh, like their habitat to be wet, well ponded, because they're amazing swimmers, but very awkward on the land. And so when we, we look at this landscape picture here, um, beaver here have helped create and maintain wetlands. Um, they've helped create habitat for wildlife and salmon. They provide important rearing habitat for the juvenile salmon that Rob just talked about through keeping calm water um, in their pools and slowing water down as it flows through the, our stream and river systems. Um, and it helps to provide that calm water that our, the juvenile salmon need. Um, beaver and salmon have evolved for uh, many, many, many years uh, prior to humans coming to our region. So um, some of the concerns we hear out there with landowners is that the beaver dam is blocking the, the migrating fish or the fish's ability to move up and down the stream. And really, um, it, it's not always true. In certain cases, it can be, um, but um, most of the time, the fish will find a way around. Um, so you can see this picture, and Thomas, if you'll hit the next animation, you can see these lines are actually all that intricate um, uh, work in there is beaver dams, and they can get as so old that vegetation will grow on the top of dams. So um, beaver are amazing creatures. They have a lot of my respect, but I also um, know and have had to deal with a lot of their impacts. And some of the issues that they can have are flooding from their dam building. It'll flood roads, property. Um, it can saturate or flood drain fields. Um, flooding of crops or eating of crops is a concern, and they also damage trees and other vegetation and landscaping or in uh, natural areas. Um, they can also have issues from dam failure where there'll be suddenly a rush of water coming down a stream. So these are going to be some of the conflict resolution devices that we talk with landowners about. Um, the first one here is a notch exclusion device um, is what we refer to it as or a NED. 
Um, notching a dam will only provide some temporary reduction in the ponding behind the dam about one or two days before the beaver kind of come out and fix it. Um, the net is designed to keep that notch open um, and allow water to flow out of the pond to set the pond level at an acceptable level for the landowner as well as the beaver. Um, I'll note that extreme care needs to be taken when notching dams as it can cause impacts to downstream landowners or downstream property. Um, you generally want to bring it down at an inch or two at a time. A pond leveler is another device that um, has been used to um, allow more water to flow through a beaver dam. Um, you'll see the pictures above. It involves a, a large corrugated, uh, generally about a 12 inch pipe um, and a caging around the inlet and a caging around the outlet on the downstream side of the pond. Um, pond levelers um, are a pretty effective way of controlling the level of a, of a dam or a level of the water behind a, a beaver dam. Um, some of the constraints to the site are that you need a deep area behind the dam to place the um, inlet caging. Um, otherwise, if it's too shallow, the beaver will just build a dam around the inlet pipe cage and essentially um, um, keep it from functioning. Um, some other issues is that it needs to be strung out pretty far downstream um, to a point about 20 feet beyond the dam where the, the beaver tend to not go and investigate why water is flowing down there. Um, these devices are generally best applied to large dams and not smaller check dams that'll be constructed. Um, downstream, or um, they're not very effective on small streams where the channel is pretty confined. Um, they are becoming um, used less and less um, because they're uh, uh, difficult to permit with WDFW, uh, uh, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, due to concerns with uh, velocity flows through the pipe um, and fish passage. Um, so we'll, we'll get a little bit more into permitting later in the section and talk about uh, WDFW's role in, in um, permitting um, in-stream structures. The next um, tool in our tool belt to um, mitigate the impacts of beavers are um, culvert excluders or beaver deceivers. Um, these devices generally involve constructing a cage of some type around um, the inlet of the culvert that doesn't um, allow the beaver to build a dam in front of it or to um, what they tend to favor with culverts is to just shove sticks and mud and logs in there and dam it up as best as they can um, and clog the pipe. So um, these devices construct uh, a protected cage away from the culvert inlet. Um, they tend to, same issues um, with the um, pond levelers is that the caging needs to be built far enough and deep enough water to where the dam or where the beaver cannot build a dam around the caging. So um, that picture um, on the uh, right there of the triangle cage uh, made of metal, you can see that there's sediments built up and pushed up against that, that caging. Um, and that's the beavers um, trying to, to uh, restrict the flow going out of that culvert exclusion. Um, there are some issues with these. They require frequent ma uh, maintenance because just natural leaf litter uh, and sticks and twigs and whatnot will get caught in the fencing and clog up the culvert. Um, also in urban areas, trash can be an issue and rack up on there. Um, one of the things with culverts is there's both privately owned culverts and publicly owned culverts. Um, so culvert ownership needs to be determined um, before a device is put on it. Um, um, you can contact uh, myself at SWIM to uh, get more information to see if a culvert is public or private. Um, you also need to apply for an, an HPA, which is a hydraulic project approval permit through the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Again, we'll, we'll go into that a little more later in the presentation. So one of the easiest things a landowner can do um, if they're concerned about vegetation on their property or they're having issues with beaver um, um, taking out vegetation on your property is to simply cage the individual tree off and or um, 
to cage off an area of planting. Um, simple three foot high fence um, will work. Um, materials are generally pretty cheap. It's easy for a landowner to do. Um, and there's no permits required for this type of action uh, because all your the work is done above and out of the water. Um, generally, beaver are gonna take down um, vegetation for two reasons. For smaller diameter, say wrist size to pinky size, they're gonna be hauling that away as a food source. So they eat the bark and the cambium layer around the, um, underneath the bark um, is their main source of food and nutrients. Um, and they also use it for building material for their dams and lodges. Um, and they'll also take out large trees, um, conifers specifically, because they shade out their preferred um, vegetation, which is willows, dogwood, and uh, various other shrubs that are of smaller diameter. Trapping is another option for managing beaver. Um, this generally is not a long-term solution. Um, if one habitat is good for beaver, then if you trap uh, one or the family that is there, there's generally going to be another family or individual beaver that moves in to set up shop. Um, I've heard of it buying landowners six months of flood-free time, and I've heard it uh, buying them 10 years of flood-free time. So it just kind of depends on what's going on in the area. But most beaver families um, consist of a mom and a dad, and they'll have a litter of two to five kits every year. The kits are the little beaver. And after about a year, the kits are kicked out and um, off to find a new home for themselves. Um, and the beavers live for about 10 to 15 years. Um, the county uh, can provide some technical guidance on beaver management, but there's nothing on the ground that a county can assist with as far as beaver management. But there's two great organizations out there that can help you with installing some of these devices. Um, the Snohomish Conservation District, as well as Beavers Northwest are great organizations that can help you on the ground with beaver management. Great. Uh, that was great, Adam. Um, the one of the um, one of the things we talk about with beavers that kind of segues into impacts to streams are beavers are not bad in of themselves, but they do interact with our properties and our streams in ways that we might not prefer. Um, so there are impacts to our streams that um, our uh, human preference or because of our infrastructure, we prefer that these impacts don't happen. There are also impacts to the stream that um, negatively affect habitat and water quality. And Rob talked about a lot of those as well. Um, so I will quick um, breeze through some of the types of pollution, um, talk about bank erosion just a little bit, um, loss of vegetation and channel complexity, um, and then a few uh, notable invasive species um, that we deal with a lot that you might, um, you might have on your property um, and you might recognize. So pollution, uh, this is a lot of what Rob talked about earlier and pollution comes in a lot of different forms. Um, and this is a picture that you might recognize from earlier. Um, when we talked about all the different land uses that this picture represents with, um, you have the, the urban areas and there's uh, forested, some passive agriculture, some pretty intensive agriculture. Um, and then um, a lot of these, uh, homes that are popping up in some of these areas. Um, all of these have an impact on the rivers and streams, um, especially uh, through development and urbanization. So we talked about some of the metals um, with Rob um, and things coming from, from our tires, uh, things that are washing straight off the pavement and going right into our storm drains. Uh, usually most urban areas, about 80% of stormwater is untreated. It's going straight from the roads straight from your cars, straight from everything that's washing down the streets and into the storm drain, right into our streams. It's not filtered, it's not treated. Um, and that's really a direct impact, impact on water quality. Um, we also get a lot of the fine sediments from washing straight off these hard surfaces, um, straight off our, our banks um, that don't have a lot of vegetation and off of places like construction sites that have a lot of uh, open, open and exposed sediments. Um, and these are uh, huge material inputs uh, to the stream and can really cloud the water, increase turbidity and, and can really have a negative impact on 
uh, a lot of the insects and, and young salmon um, in our rivers and streams. A um, few of the nutrients that, that Rob talked about, again, I'll just go over this quickly. Phosphorus and nitrogen are very important for plant growth and a lot of our um, aquatic organisms, but it, at a certain threshold, they become um, dangerous for water quality, whether they're causing um, these toxic algal, blo algal blooms or um, if they're uh, kind of feeding the system too much where we start losing a lot of our dissolved oxygen because all these little organisms are are using the oxygen too much and there's not enough left for uh, some of the insects or the salmonid species. Um, and then you'll see temperature here. Um, temperature is a, is a, a type of pollution um, because temperatures too high are not great for a lot of the species that exist in our waterways, especially salmon. So there is a lethal limit when water gets too hot that salmon can't actually survive anymore. And so when we have these low summer flows in the river, there's not a lot of water um, and the sun heats that up really fast. So if there's not a lot of shade and temperature increases uh, over the summer, it can be uh, lethal to our salmon um, and, and it'll really stress out a lot of the aquatic uh, structure. And then our physical habitat, um, a lot of the sediment and the erosion um, can really change the morphology. Remember the shape of the stream. Um, a lot of that will change when we introduce a lot of sediment really fast. And a lot of this is natural. It happens. Erosion has always happened. There's always sediment moving through and the river is always changing. But if we're introducing a lot or we're exposing a lot of banks, we get amounts of sediment that are unhealthy, um, not only to the salmon, but also to the way the river moves and it's changing the shape. And sometimes that's a, a threat to our infrastructure um, and our homes. So this is a, a photo that Rob referred to earlier. Um, and a lot of the erosion that you might see on your stream, your river is not this intense. Um, and it rarely is. This is a photo on the Pilchuck River in 2019, um, where we had one big flood event that took 20 feet off the bank. And then the next flood event took another 15 feet. And then now you can see a structure at risk of going in the river. Um, so not all of you live on places like that with that kind of risk. Um, but you might live on a place where you see on the outside bend of your stream or river, um, a lot of change each year. We get a big flood event, really strong flows, um, and you lose, uh, maybe you lose a foot, maybe you lose inches, or maybe you lose 10 feet. Um, and you notice that on your property uh, when, when you lose uh, that frontage and you lose that, that space. Um, often this is associated with um, the lack of structure. Um, some of the ways that in the past we have tried to uh, mitigate this is put in rocks along the stream or put in a hard armoring um, sort of structure that disallows any sort of movement of the stream. Um, and this is um, very effective at keeping the stream where it is, um, but it is not very effective on uh, kind of keeping a healthy habitat and a healthy riparian forest intact. Usually this means taking a lot of a lot of the vegetation away, exposing that stream, disallowing it from moving throughout its floodplain and really distributing the nutrients that are being carried through the watershed. Um, so as we lose habitat features um, from erosion, um, we wanna make sure that there are certain ways that we try and uh, restore those. And we'll talk about in a second, riparian planting and riparian forest, forests are one of those ways that we can help restore and aid these riparian areas that are experiencing a lot of erosion. Erosion and solutions to erosion often lead to a, a reduction in channel complexity. So whether this is hard armoring along this bank to keep the river from moving on your property and ero eroding, or if uh, a lot of the vegetation was taken out for agriculture or for aesthetics, or just because it was a nuisance or a view, there's a lot of reasons why we take away um, the vegetation that was there. Um, so we might be a force that's reducing um, channel complexity by taking out vegetation. Um, but you'll also see in this photo, there's a lot of invasive species here that are removing a lot of the, the, the natural armoring of the bank, which is native vegetation. Um, so as we uh, reduce channel complexity, we lose vegetation. We also lose refuge for a lot of our species. Um, and there's not a structural diversity to the stream that allows a lot of different species to find their microhabitats that suit them just right. 
Um, along with this, you don't see any shade in this picture. Um, and so we have the sun baking this river and the temperatures are increasing and increasing um, potentially to unhealthy levels. Um, as the, the channel becomes uh, a more of a simple channel, it usually becomes a little more incised or it becomes deeper because water is moving through quicker. Um, as this happens, it's less likely that the river will flood its banks as often and distribute a lot of the nutrients and distribute a lot of the pollutants into the floodplain. Um, and when we distribute water and nutrients into the floodplain, two things happen. One is these negative uh, pol pollutants, you know, high levels of different pollutants will actually move into the soil and the, the plants might uh, break those down more, but they also, they stick in the soil and they get removed from the water. So as that water uh, moves back into the river, it is cleaner than it was before. And then the second thing is, as the water filters down through the water table, it stays in the floodplain longer. And so this is where our floodplain wetlands are very important because we are able to store water for longer periods. And then as the low flows in the summer gets really, really low, we still have water in that water table and in the floodplain that's slowly going back into the river and keeping the water levels just a little bit higher, just a little bit colder, um, supporting a lot of our aquatic life. And so um, one of the, the results of losing native vegetation is usually invasive plants. And I think you all are familiar with many of these. Um, they're very aggressive and an invasive plant usually has a pretty severe detrimental impact to the habitat quality in the riparian area. So the background photo here is Himalayan blackberry. Um, if you don't have it on your property, it's probably close by. Um, this plant can grow about 15 feet in a year, um, and you may have experienced this. Um, and so what it does is it grows in very thick patches um, and tends to spread. Um, and what many of these invasive plants do is by growing really quickly and really densely, they suppress the growth of any of the native plants. And so even if you have a lot of trees growing up, um, many of the understory plants are not able to grow and the trees aren't able to reproduce because there's too dense of a cover of this, this invasive plant so that's very aggressive. So Himalayan blackberry is something that we can control mechanically. We can cut it down, we can dig out the roots and that's very effective, even if it's uh, pretty laborious. Um, there are also chemical uh, solutions to treating this plant. Um, and if, if that's a route um, that you wanna go because it seems like less, less work, uh, please contact uh, Adam or the county or contact me and we can help you through how to apply chemicals um, at rates that are, are uh, the safest for the environment and for human health in the watershed. The second plant uh, here is uh, English ivy um, and this one is uh, uh, taking some of our forest by storm uh, by moving across the ground really quickly and then climbing our trees. Um, It'll disallow a lot of sunlight from reaching some of our branches. It's very heavy on the trees. Um, and it also suppresses any sort of seed development by the native species on the forest floor. And then lastly, we have this grass. And this was in one of our previous photos too. Um, we call this reed canary grass. And this is one that's been um, introduced to our wetlands and really aggressively taking over a lot of our riparian areas. And one of the reasons that we do not like this plant being in our wetlands and riparian areas is because one, it forms a monoculture. There's nothing else growing in this photo, <clears throat> but two, it tends to form very dense root mats that um, tend, they start constraining the channels um, and not allowing them to move how they wanna move um, and keeping them very constrained. And when it does that, we start digging deeper in the channel instead of going wider and moving where they want to go. Um, so this plant is um, forms a monoculture, doesn't provide any shade to the stream, so temperatures might start rising, doesn't do a very good job at filtering out nutrients, and doesn't really allow the channel to move and access most of its floodplain. And the last one is kind of the um, kind of the real villain of some of our noxious weeds. And that's uh, uh, himo, uh, sorry, is, is knotweed, Japanese knotweed. Um, there's a few other varieties of knotweed. Um, and this one is uh, very aggressive. It grows in our forest floors uh, very quickly. 
the riparian area can be covered in this in a matter of a couple years, and it's very hard to control. Uh, if you have this on your property um, and you don't really know where to start, um, contact uh, the conservation district, contact Adam to see where we can find resources and strategies to start helping you control this um, because the, the impact similar to the rest of these species um, is drastic because of how aggressive it is. It really suppresses a lot of the native growth and it also um, is built to um, not hold the stream bank. Um, it actually increases erosion because it has a very weak root system and that's part of how it reproduces by breaking off, lodging somewhere else downstream and then growing a new plant. Um, so this one is very aggressive um, and it's very uh, concerning in um, a lot of our county and there are very active measures to coordinate the control of this throughout our watersheds and to try and keep a healthy riparian area full of native plants instead of um, not weed monocultures. So when we have um, a lot of these impacts, uh, one, of, one of the ways that we go about treating or mitigating for a lot of the impacts is uh, streamside restoration. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we have impacts from erosion to invasive species to uh, channel degradation and uh, simplification of you know, our channels. Uh, and there are a lot of ways to fix this, but the one that we use um, that really addresses most of our impacts in one way or another is planting native trees and shrubs. So we are able to manage invasive species, um, one, by removing them, and two, replacing them with a plant that wants to be there um, and has evolved to be here and really supports a healthy habitat. Um, it's the most cost efficient way and the most a reliable long-term strategy to create a healthy forest and a healthy stream system. Um, and it really uh, ensures uh, a long-term diversity um, and structure of our forests. And that is very important for um, our habitats and for our water quality. So to install a buffer, uh, you really need to take out everything undesirable on your property. And that's gonna start with removing invasive species. Um, there's a lot of strategies and, and we will uh, send out to you um, some resources to find the right strategies for the for the weed that you are trying to take out. <clears throat> um, so treating um, blackberry, cutting it out um, is one example of how we're preparing the riparian area for um, restoration and for planting. So next we plant. Uh, we prepare an area and we plant all native species and we get a good mix of uh, deciduous trees and uh, evergreen trees and conifers. And then a lot of our shrubs that are providing a lot of the food and forage for uh, species passing through um, a young forest. This is a picture of a large scale restoration planting. And many of you likely don't have properties that look like this. Um, if you do, your property could look this way. Um, if you don't, um, we can make a lot of different designs to suit kind of your needs on, uh, on your property to install native plants in a way that fits uh, your goals for your property. Um, this looks like almost like agriculture. And I wanna be clear that a lot of our restoration is not intended to look like agriculture. Um, it's messy and we like to let our rivers and our plants grow as they will and provide the benefits that they always have by doing their own thing. So we don't need to row plant um, necessarily. It does make uh, maintaining this much more efficient um, because after we plant, there is a certain amount of maintenance that needs to be done as these young trees and shrubs are growing into um, mature plants. We need to um, give them the best chance. That means keeping the, in this photo, reed canary grass, but keeping the invasive species down and back so that we can give them the best chance at survival. After several years, we will get plants that are what we call free to grow, as in they don't need too much more maintenance because they're ready to compete with these invasive species surrounding them. So here is a photo of uh, a western red cedar uh, in the first year at planting, um, what it might look like at year seven and then year 15. <clears throat> so when we plant a native buffer, we are playing the long game. We are being patient because we know the benefits of having a healthy riparian forest, um, but it does take time. And so this is not an overnight solution, but it is one that is dependable, reliable, uh, and effective. 
Um, so now I guess we will pass to uh, Adam to talk about how you might work in your stream area um, and how you might consider decisions on your property. Great, thanks Thomas. And uh, I, I wanna echo Thomas's uh, statement about, you know, restoration and riparian buffer plantings. They don't need to look like uh, monoculture row crops. Um, really ultimately what we want is what we refer to as wild and woolly. Um, and uh, I can't take credit for that, that phrase. It's my, uh, my mentor here at SWIM uh, came up with it, but you know, nature isn't always um, tidy and neat. Um, and that's kind of what our streams and wetlands and our salmon species need ultimately, um, but that we can find a nice mix of the two. Um, so I get the fun part of talking about working in streams and I go back and forth on this title um, because um, it's not necessarily just working in streams, which is, is a little misleading about what we what we ultimately want to encourage landowners to take on on their own, um, because actually working in streams on a salmon recovery project or bank stabilization project, um, it, it, it can be challenging and um, we can debate the merits of the regulations that exist, um, but it is the framework that we work in and there are reasons why that regulation is there um, it's not to be cumbersome or to get in the way of a project, um, but it's a way to make sure that what we are doing and proposing um, is going to have the intended effect on, on the goal um, without impacting those around us upstream, downstream, or adjacent across the stream. And um, from the county's perspective, we are not exempt from, from any of the regulations that a, a private landowner would be under when it comes to working in or adjacent to streams. So um, I'm going to go through um, this section of our presentation um, called Working in Streams. Um, I'm going to th throw out a very odd housekeeping thing. I'm um, calling you from my office and uh, apparently um, thinking that this would be the best internet connection, most reliable, quiet space for me. And I found out that the lights turn off automatically every hour. So um, if eight o'clock strikes and I'm in the middle of talking and it goes dark, um, I might run away for two seconds to turn the lights back on. So I, I apologize for the uh, lack of professionalism over here. Um, so um, basically what we're gonna cover is um, why these regulations exist and for critical areas and talk a little bit about what critical areas are um, and then um, what some of the regulated activities are. Um, we'll touch on some of the things that you, you don't need a permit for and you don't necessarily need any permissions to do. Um, and again, Thomas and I are here to provide you that guidance and resources um, and confidence to tackle some of these projects on your own with the knowledge and understanding that you're doing it the right way. Um, so think of us this year as a resource to empower you to, um, to make an impact on your property and that improves not only your property, but the water that flows through it and is temporarily visiting. Um, and then we'll go into some local and state and um, touch on federal regulations when it comes to um, streams and wetlands and other critical areas. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, thanks. Um, so again, kind of why regulations? What what's the purpose of them besides um, the government dictating rules? Um, well, from from this these numbers here, we've noticed since 1975 to 2015 that um, we've lost about half of our adult Puget Sound Chinook um, salmon returning to the Puget Sound region. Um, so um, fish declines are a big part of the puzzle and a big piece of why some of these regulations exist. Um, what we do on our property is probably not the direct impact that is, is affecting salmon populations, but it's when it's your property and my property and a neighbor's property and all of those added up, if we're all 
um, managing our properties in a way that are putting pollutants into the streams or reducing riparian vegetation or um, not controlling invasive species, it's kind of a death by a thousand cuts. It's all adding up. Um, and so the fish question is a major driver. Um, you know, our streamside um, properties and the habitat that's there is not the only piece of the puzzle, but it, it's, it's a major one. And it is something that we can actively um, work to improve on. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons. Um, and many of the impacts described by Thomas um, in the previous um, um, set of slides uh, talking about uh, increased erosion, um, reduction of riparian vegetation that leads to that erosion, um, the uh, construction sites discharging sediments into local water bodies, you know, it's all of these things added up and, and a little bit of sediment um, is, is imbalanced with nature because erosion is natural. Um, but it's when we've increased it toward beyond that balancing point that we, we can we can cause impacts as, as folks in, on the on the streams and rivers. Um, the potential um, effects that we could have on neighboring properties upstream downstream if we're doing something to the stream or in the stream or to the wetland. Um, it's 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 not necessarily um, impacting our property or maybe we're doing something that is reducing impacts on our property, but it's just pushing the problem downstream or upstream. Um, so um, there, there are many types of regulated critical areas. And um, one of the things that you want to you want to keep in mind is there's the critical area, be it the wetland or the lake or the stream channel. And that's what we would refer to as the critical area, but the critical area in the regulatory world and in our world, it, it spans beyond that that stream or that lake or that that wetland and to what's called the associated buffer. And so the buffer is generally going to be upland um, vegetation um, or or native um, vegetation that's diverse and wild and woolly, and that helps protect that specific critical area when you have a planting of native trees and shrubs along your stream, even if it's only 15 feet wide or 30 feet wide, it's protecting that section of stream from pollutants that are running off the landscape. It's protecting that stream from erosion or undue erosion. Um, it's helping provide shade on the stream or the wetland, um, or it's providing habitat along a lake shoreline. So when we think of our critical areas, there's the stream channel, but there's also the vegetated area outside of that. And there's there's different different regulated buffer widths anywhere in Snohomish County. It's anywhere from 50 feet up to 150 feet, depending on the critical area. But the wider things are, the better it is, the more adaptive that stream or that river will be, the more um, it will be able to um, um, mitigate the impacts of, a, of a, a warming climate or a changing climate or increased flooding. Um, it's more resilient the wider that buffer is. There's more room for impacts that don't negatively um, contribute to the, the degradation of the river or the stream or the wetland. Um, so th there's wetlands, there's streams, rivers, and lakes, which is kind of the, the big topic that we're focusing on tonight. Um, but there's also channel migration zones, geological hazards, such as, as steep slopes and slides. Um, and then there's critical aquifer recharge areas. And so, you know, a channel migration, the picture on the top left, that's um, a road up um, near Mount Rainier. I think that's the Carbon River. Um, and the, the river used to be over to the right in the picture. Um, and you can see the road kind of uh, center front. And the river just decided to move over. Um, because water is a lazy element and it's going to follow the path of least resistance. Um, so uh, like Thomas showed you that LIDAR image, the river moves back and forth looking for that path of least resistance. So in Snohomish County, um, in unincorporated uh, Snohomish County and in most jurisdictions, so most cities, um, we protect our critical areas through code through what's known as a native growth protection area or a critical area protection area. Um, and I, I know that name is, sounds very redundant. Um, more commonly, um, you're gonna hear native growth protection area or NGPA, um, both that and CAPA can be used interchangeably. Um, 
These are um, sites, they, they are um, areas designated either when a, a large development is put in or when a pro property goes for a building permit or a land disturbing activities permit um, to change something on the landscape. In order to get those permits issued, we, we need to know where the critical areas are and they need to be protected through a native growth protection area. So um, just these are just an example. This isn't a uh, totally inclusive list of activities um, that would require a permit, um, but it, it kind of gives you a framework or an idea of what types of activities, um, if you're thinking about doing on your property, that you would need to consult for a permit, um, possibly more than one. Um, basically, um, if you're doing any alteration to the natural flow of the stream, um, generally that will require a permit. Um, so this could be, um, um, you know, if you're placing um, logs in a stream or river to provide fish habitat, well, you're altering that natural flow at that time of, of the river or stream. And so um, that's gonna require a permit. Or if you're altering the stream bed, so the land that the water flows over, or if you're altering the bank, um, so say you're putting in a bridge, um, you're going to have to put in some footings, the bridge is going to span across the, the stream or river, um, and that can have an alteration on how that stream reacts. If you build your footings and your bridge too low um, during high flows, it could back up onto a neighboring property or, or affect your property. Um, if you're doing any fish rearing, so raising um, juvenile salmon and releasing them into a stream, um, if you're doing any earth moving excavation, uh, dredging, digging, filling, um, anything that's moving um, earth or bringing in um, um, soil or, or other fill material, um, um, that could trigger the need for a permit. Um, brush control or tree removal in certain areas adjacent to critical into streams or wetlands or steep slopes, um, that is, is regulated as well. Um, because as Thomas touched on, that, that has that, that root mass that our uh, diverse native trees and shrubs have um, provide a matrix that holds that soil together. So when we start removing it adjacent or directly next to a stream or river or wetland, we can expose um, potential erosion of that soil. Um, and then just construction in general, building structures, um, outbuildings, homes, garages, um, any permanent structure, roads, um, fencing um, can potentially require a permit if it's going through a buffer or a critical area. So activities that you would likely not need to get a permit for um, are control of invasive species um, that is generally, that is exempted from its county code. Um, you'll see the little asterisks there. Um, there are situations where approval would be needed, but not a permit, depending on how much of an invasive species you're removing. So again, when we remove vegetation from the landscape, we create areas of bare soil that can have the potential to erode um, through precipitation, through flooding. And so um, when we re remove large areas of even invasive species, we need to have a plan in place to temporarily control sediments an erosion and um, a plan to revegetate that area. Um, other activities that um, likely don't require a permit include planting native trees and shrubs um, within a critical area or a critical area buffer, um, walking um, in an NGPA or a critical area protection area or critical area buffer. Um, pedestrian access is encouraged um, in NGPAs um, with kind of a leave no trace ethos. Um, you, you know, you don't wanna be removing vegetation to create a path, but accessing your, your NGPA or your critical area buffer, or your riparian forest, the more you're connecting with it, the more you're gonna appreciate it. So I, I do hear a lot from landowners that I meet with or talk with that, uh, you know, the neighbor said that the, the county will find you if you even look at the NGPA and that's, that's not the case. Um, we, we want enjoyment of these, these nat natural areas because um, the more you use it, the more you recreate in it, the more you're going to come to appreciate it and take care of it. Um, so passive recreation, you know, um, going through a riparian forest to access uh, 
a fishing area as long as it's on public property um, or you have the private property owner's permission. Um, berry picking, mushroom hunting, um, removal of hazard trees from an, a native growth protection area is one I deal with a lot um, and get questions a lot about. Um, it, it's allowed, there's no permit, but there is a, an approval process um, with the county to remove uh, a, a hazard tree. Um, and I can um, field any questions offline. Um, all my contact info is available on, on what that process looks like. Um, so uh, the potential regulating agencies that you might run into um, when proposing a project in or near a critical area or buffer. Um, for Snohomish County residents, you would work with planning and development services um, generally, the permits through them are going to be the land disturbing activities uh, permit. So that's any earthwork, um, grading, filling that you would propose to do. Um, there are shoreline permits if you're going to develop or alter a shoreline. Um, and then building permits if you're going to be installing a structure. Um, there are some folks, I believe, um, that are, are within city limits. So if you're in, say, the city of Snohomish or the city of Lake Stevens, um, all those, those, those jurisdictions have pretty much the same um, building codes as the county does, but they have their own permitting process. So you'd wanna check with your um, local city um, building department to confirm what, what would be needed or what's, um, what needs a permit. Um, we talked briefly in the Beavers department, uh, department in the Beaver uh, section about um, um, the need for what we call an HPA, a hydraulic project approval permit. And an HPA is issued through the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. And basically, um, if you do anything in the stream, in the stream bed, anything that affects the flow or could affect the flow of water could trigger the potential need for an HPA. So Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife would work with you on that. Um, the Mill Creek office, um, if you just Google WDFW Mill Creek, all their contact info comes up. Um, for folks that on potentially on lakes or are looking to install structures potentially in river beds, um, there they a lot of our large rivers, um, small rivers or large streams are what known as waters of the state. Um, the water is regulated by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the land below the water, um, especially on lakes, um, is regulated. They're called um, bottom lands are regulated by the Department of Natural Resources. So DNR could potentially be another state agency that you run into. Um, unfortunately, regulations are like an onion. There's layers to peel back and layers to deal with. Um, the last one that um, would only involve pretty large projects um, would be the Army Corps of Engineers or the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, Generally, this is going to fall under um, discharge of fill material into states waters of the state, um, and so uh, this doesn't come up very often in, in a residential project or, or you know, a single-family residency parcel. So, general permit requirements: if you're working in the water, it's going to be late summer when there's low flows and no fish present. Um, expect to control erosion, um, expect um, to control turbidity. So that'd be erosion or sediments making it into the water, or if you're digging in the water, that's gonna stir up sediments. Um, if you remove a uh, temporarily impact streamside or vegetation adjacent to a wetland, um, it needs to be revegetated immediately after your project. And then um, you'll wanna call your permitting agency if anything changes in your plans, or if something fails during construction um, you can see that bottom picture on the right is a uh, um, uh, sediment silt fence that didn't do its job um, during a heavy rain event. And a lot of that sediment got washed right over and into the forest. So um, that's the permitting section. It's, it's generally kind of the scariest section to um, think about. And there we go. I'm in the dark. I'm so sorry. Well, oh, I think I think we can get through this. Um, so um, use, please contact me. I can help answer questions or concerns you have about permitting. I can provide some resources and point you in the right direction to get the answers. Um, we want to encourage landowners to help protect and restore their streamside, um, their streamside properties. 
Um, and we want to take away the fear that if you do something, you're going to get in trouble. So um, that's that's kind of a big role that I want to provide for you is to, is to help kind of answer those questions. Um, so this next section is on um, getting support, um, basically resources on um, who can help you. And, and <laughs> the other question is, if you don't want to speak to a regulating agency, um, which I totally understand, um, you know, who are the best folks to contact to kind of give you a peace of mind um, that you can ask questions with the confidence that, that you don't feel like you're going to get in trouble. Um, I can tell you that my position and department is non-regulatory um, within the county. Um, we have a policy of not um, reporting um, violations of code that we see out there. Um, I may point it out to you um, in a very polite, professional manner, um, but um, it stays between uh, you and I. Um, so, um, go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, Thomas. So, um, where to find help, um, is, uh, several agencies, um, NGOs, um, and tribes are out there that, um, really, um, have an interest in salmon recovery, um, in protecting habitat, in protecting wild, wildlife, um, and, and, um, all, all the, recreators that use our waters and keeping them clean and healthy and safe. Um, and so there's, there's actually a lot of folks out there that are out there to help you. Um, first two um, are obviously the, the presenting agencies and, and organizations here tonight, Snohomish County Surface Water Management and the Snohomish Conservation District um, are, are kind of what I would recommend as your go-to resources to get answers um, and assistance in um, restoring your streamside areas um, generally or frequently. Both our, our organizations have grant funding and are looking for um, willing voluntary um, partners um, from landowners to, to help us um, get the dollars on the ground and get the trees in the ground. Um, so um, I'd encourage you to um, look at our, our web pages, um, chat with Thomas and myself on, um, on what we have available and what we think we can help with. Um, but other agencies to help answer questions um, would be the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. As I mentioned, um, the Mill Creek office is the one that services uh, most of Snohomish County. Um, they're great folks to um, assist with anything fish, anything wildlife, anything um, basically in the water. Um, they're going to be your go-to for answering questions and concerns. Um, the Department of Natural Recesses, Resources is going to be more focused on um, um, waters of the state, so larger river systems um, where there's uh, a public interest in, in the um, resource. Um, so if you're, if you're proposing work or have questions about and live on a larger river system, um, DNR might be a, a supportive um, agency. Um, there's the Department of, of um, Ecology. They focus more on clean water and water-related concerns, pollution. So if you have concerns about uh, polluted water, um, either through chemicals or um, um, sediment discharges, Department of Ecology can be of assistance for that. Um, other agencies that are non-governmental or NGO um, include Sound Salmon Solutions. They are a, a nonprofit in our area that works to Im improve salmon habitat, as their name uh, suggests. So they work a lot with landowners on riparian vegetation um, and replanting along streams and rivers. Um, they can also assist with um, larger scale salmon recovery projects. So in stream um, work that includes um, placement of large wood in the water. Um, Adopt a Stream Foundation is another um, agency or another uh, NGO that's, that's um, based actually in Snohomish County out of McCollum Park, um, kind of in the South County area. Um, they have a great wetland boardwalk to go check out. Um, and they do a lot of in-stream um, work with private landowners to, again, place um, uh, structures of wood in the streams that are critical to salmon habitat and other uh, aquatic species. Uh, Wild Fish Conservancy is another nonprofit based out of Duval um, that can assist with um, um, a lot of in-stream um, questions or in-stream projects. And then there are two local tribes that work um, on salmon recovery in our area for the Stiligwamish watershed. Um, that would be the Stiligwamish tribe. And for the Snohomish, Skycomish, um, Snoqualmie, 
that would be the the Tulalip tribes um, that would um, that are doing work in the area, and they are also looking for um, landowners to partner with on um, salmon restoration projects. Um, there's a lot of great organizations out there doing work to improve salmon habitat. Um, however, much of the property um, along rivers adjacent to streams is in private ownership, especially in the Puget Lowlands. Um, so private landowner partnerships are critical to us doing a lot of the good work that we like doing. And so um, another thing I want to point out, um, one part of the, as, as Sarah mentioned at the beginning, um, this, this um, evening's program was bought, uh, brought by some um, great funders, um, and the SWIM has a, a grant through um, one of those funders to not only put on these workshops, but also to provide on the ground assistance for landowners to implement a riparian restoration or a riparian enhancement project. So we have funding to work with private landowners um, to pay for um, those kind of those types of uh, projects that Thomas described in the last uh, previous section. Um, so we have money that will come in and help with invasive control or site prep as we refer to it as, um, planting. Um, we didn't really get into mulching, but sometimes mulching is an important component of a restoration project to help protect plants, help reduce uh, weed competition and to insulate the soil to retain moisture um, and then follow up maintenance. Um, as Thomas pointed out, maintenance is probably um, um, one of the most, if not the most important steps in a riparian planting project. Um, I wish we could just plant and walk away. It would make our jobs really easy and we would get a lot done, but that is not the reality. Um, generally, uh, three to five years of follow-up maintenance is required. And so we have some funding to provide some of that maintenance. Um, and we're looking to work on salmon bearing streams. So if you're a landowner on a salmon bearing stream um, and you're interested in uh, discussing a, a potential project on your property, um, feel free to contact me uh, for more information and to set up a site visit. Um, and I, I wanted to, to call out to another um, county program, the, King, uh, the Snohomish County Noxious Weed Program. Um, they also have grant funding to assist with knotweed control. Thomas talked briefly about knotweed. It's rapidly becoming one of the most um, negative, negative impacting um, species in our region. Um, and they have funding to work with private landowners on knotweed control. So if that is something you have on your property and are interested in controlling it, um, I can connect you to them and find out if you're in their funding area. Again, we, we really want to acknowledge our uh, funders um, who uh, provided the grants that made all this possible, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, the Department of Ecology, Department of Natural Resources, and the uh, United States EPA um, all provided funding to um, both organizations to make this happen. And with that, uh, we'll take any questions that folks have. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate that. And thank you, yeah. Thomas and Rob as well. Really enjoyed the information and it's been super helpful. Um, a question that came in when, you know, discussing some of the invasive plant species and more cultures, um, someone asked, what about watercress? Our creek suddenly started filling up with it a past couple years ago. So any advice um, about watercress and creeks? Yeah, it can be challenging. Um, the watercress will um, take advantage of kind of those low mucky floodplains. Um, you can, um, it, controlling it is going to be challenging um, um, because when you're working in a stream with, with um, invasive species that are non-native or even some of our native species um, are what I lovingly refer to as aggressive. Um, um, it, it can be, especially in that habitat, it's hard to pull it because then you're creating a bunch of sediment. Um, you don't necessarily want to treat it with an herbicide because you're so close to the water. Um, the recommendation that I would generally have for landowners is to um, try to transition a desirable species. Um, so maybe pulling a small area um, during low flows and then being ready to replant with something desirable. 
um, that potentially is taller that can outcompete the watercress. Um, there are other native species that are fit a similar niche um, as watercress. Um, um, but I would I would also say that um, out of all the invasive species out there, watercress would probably be on the low level of concern. Um, and I, I also believe we have a native one as well. So you'd want to be careful um, about um, potentially removing a, a native uh, uh, species. Um, so that, that's it's right in the wheelhouse of, of um, assistance that Thomas and I can provide. So if it's something you're interested in, reach out to one of us or both of us, and um, we can come out and meet with you and take a look and, and kind of provide um, more site-specific recommendations. I don't know, Thomas, if you have anything else to add? No, nope, that's about it um, for right now. I think that's a good answer. Great, and just let everyone know, I'm kind of just filtering these as they come through. So I will definitely get to your question. Um, but the next one is any advice on getting rid of reef canary grass? Uh, hopes and prayers. Um, it's a, uh, yeah, it, reef canary grass is extremely challenging. Um, it, it, the technique that I would recommend is going to be dependent on how established it is. Um, if this is a, an ag field that has been fallow for 20 years and has just had reef canary grass just take a foothold, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot more challenging to get that under control. Um, the, the best, the best kind of holistic answer to almost all of our invasives, well, not all of them, but a, a good majority of them is establishing shade and establishing um, uh, desirable vegetation that's going to take up the spot that that reed canary grass filled. So if it's a fairly new patch of reed canary grass, I would say continual mowing along with establishing desirable vegetation. I'm always going to bang the drum for native vegetation. Um, but honestly, as long as it's not an invasive species and it's something that you want on your property um, and it's going to fill in and provide long-term shade, go for it. Um, but generally, th the problem with reed canary grass is that it, it likes very wet conditions. So there's going to be a narrow planting palette, even of native species, it's going to be do well there, um, let alone kind of horticultural or non-native species. For the, um, the well-established, um, you know, prehistoric patch of reed canary grass, it's gonna, it's gonna require a much more aggressive treatment of mowing, potential um, herbicide treatment. Um, and um, uh, my, my biggest recommendation is, is willow planting um, because it grows fast. Um, it can get through the root mat. So historic, you know, prehistoric, Reed canary grass patches will have, you know, a six inch to, I don't know, I've even seen it as close to 10 inch root mass where it's not even soil. It's just a mass of roots from the reed canary grass and dead biomass from the grass um, that you have to get through before you can get into plantable soil. So with live willow, with willow live stakes, you can shove that, that live stake through that thatch and that, that root mass and get it into soil. Um, and it'll grow. So there's a lot of different um, techniques for, for conquering reed canary grass. My hope is that you have a small patch and you're able to jump on it quickly um, and, and keep it from becoming a prehistoric patch. That's unlikely for who yeah. asked the question. I know this person, but <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so... You gotta, you gotta give them some hope. <laughs> I can help this person also. So, you know, we'll okay. talk about okay. it. But, um, Great. So the next question is, and maybe this isn't a really black and white question, but about how many feet from the middle of the stream is the riparian area? Is that something? Um, Thomas, do you want to feel this one so they don't just hear me yammering the whole time? Sure. Yeah, uh, Sarah, you're right. It's not black and white, um, but most of the time, the riparian area can be broadly defined as the area that um, that the river interacts with that uh, starts to define this the type of plants that grow within 
um, and around the river. Um, now, if we want to get more specific, we can talk about um, where is uh, the high water mark and where is the full extent of where the water is flooding. And that is a really uh, simple way to, to observe where, um, where the water and the stream is directly uh, interacting with the floodplain um, and with the riparian area. Um, it can extend beyond where the, where the flood, you know, the extent of the high flood is. Um, but uh, most of the time, it's, it's not a matter of how many feet. It's, it depends on the gradient of the floodplain and, and where that water flows and how it interacts with the floodplain. So it could be a matter of, you know, 50 feet. It could be 200 feet, depending on how much water is moving through and interacting uh, with that area on the side of, of the stream or river. Perfect. Thank you, Thomas. You have I, would, I, would, I would add something real quick um, that kind of what I always think of the riparian zone is a transition zone from the aquatic environment to the upland environment. So um, upland would be defined as um, a, an area beyond the interaction with the river, um, similar to what Thomas was saying, um, but from a vegetated plant community, so um, it's defined partially by what plants are going to grow and thrive there. So I always think of the riparian zone as, you know, alder, salmonberry, uh, willow, dogwood, um, elderberry, uh, cedar, spruce kind of plant community um, with some emergent species, potentially um, some sword fern, but but then, then kind of that, that vegetation changes to dug fir, salal, um, um, uh, drier species, red flowering current, um, um, species like that, um, as you kind of transition from that aquatic environment. That I would add that, I guess. Thank you. Um... Another question is, folks want to remove blackberries along their bank and replace with native shrubs. Do you need permission to remove non-native vegetation along waterways? So the, the code states, and, and again, I, I work in surface water management. I'm a, I'm a plant person, um, people person. I don't, I don't work for the permitting agent, the permitting department in the county, but um, the code states that um, there are some exemptions from our critical area code for um, um, impacts adjacent to those critical areas. So um, one of those exemptions is the control of noxious weeds. And that's pretty much all it says in code. Um, it references um, by best management practices. So the, the short answer is, is yes, you're allowed to control invasive species. Um, so blackberry falls under that with accepted best management practices, which um, we'll send out in our follow-up email some links to some really great resources on um, some of the common invasive species. Um, it'll be links to our, our uh, county friends to the South in King County. They put together some really good fact sheets. Um, but you'd want to take care, like I mentioned, to control erosion um, to, if you're gonna clear a large area. Um, so say you have a, just a monoculture of blackberry, um, a monoculture is just, it's one species. Um, you're gonna create quite a bare area. Um, so you wanna have a plan to temporarily cover those bare soils that you're gonna create. And you're gonna wanna have a vegetation and plan um, in place. And when I say plan, it doesn't need to be some fancy engineered drawing. It doesn't have to be, you know, a really fancy map and a fancy format of it has, you know, it says that, you know, I, Joe and Jane, you know, landowner are going to remove invasive species, remove blackberry by this method, manual, mechanical, whatever it is. Um, I'm going to control erosion by laying down several inches of mulch and I'm going to revegetate with this list of native species. So having that, um, um, is gonna is gonna be just what you need to do. If you're going in as a landowner and you have a pretty healthy vegetated riparian buffer um, or riparian corridor, I mean even if it's you know five feet wide but it's native vegetation, but you got a blackberry here, a blackberry there, or there's some ivy around a tree and a little bit on the ground, you know, go ahead and control it, remove it. You know, it's early or early detection, rapid response. It's gonna keep that invasive species from getting a foothold. Um, 
But if you have a larger uh, project you're wanting to tackle, um, you're going to want to plan things out a little bit. I, I'm 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 guilty very much of doing projects on my my property at my house where I don't think it through all the way, and then it's four hours later, and I don't have the power turned on, and and the pipe is leaking, and I don't know what to do. You don't want to be caught in that situation. Um, so um, th there's there you are allowed to remove and control invasive species. Um, I'd highly recommend that you work with Thomas or myself to help develop that plan. So you have that, those steps kind of planned out going, up, going forward and you're not just um, jumping on it. It's really easy to mow down an acre of blackberry. It's a lot more challenging to revegetate that much. So working in steps is important too. Thank you. Um... And then kind of two parts to the same question. If you have mature non-native trees, do you need permission for that to removal along our waterway? And then um, any low cost ways to obtain native plants? Obviously you're gonna plug our native plant sale, which is happening in early March. Pre-orders go on sale at the end of January, I think January 24th until early February, uh, where you can purchase like five cedars for almost ten dollars and these are bare root so just pointing that out but we can uh provide additional resources for native plants as well but uh sorry adam answers to those questions no you you said that way better than i um so um non-native tree species removal from a critical area buffer um yeah um unless it's um um unless it's uh, uh an invasive species then you're kind of covered. So say it's a holly, um, you could take that down. Um, if it's if it's an exotic tree or a non-native, but it's not it's not invasive. And basically, the guidance on that on what is a invasive species according according to the county code is if it's on the state noxious weed list. Um, and so we can provide that in the resource follow up um, that we send out to you. Um, can you still hear me? Okay, I just got a warning that my headphones died. Um, um, then you would need to follow the proper uh, removal uh, procedure if it's not on that state list. So if it's if it would need to be deemed a hazard tree, which it it would technically need to, to have the potential to fall and strike a structure, which could be a home, an outbuilding, a fence, basically anything man-made, um, that would be part of the designation of a hazard tree. Um, even exotic non-native trees that aren't invasive, they're gonna be providing function to your riparian area. Um, is it as much as a 300 year old cedar? No, um, but unless it's, a, it's spreading or causing you know, ecological harm, um, my general encouragement is to leave it be um, because its root structure is helping hold soil in place. Um, the tree is providing some level of habitat um, for, for wildlife. Um, so um, unless it's invasive, I'd encourage you to, to keep it. And yes, go to the SCD bare root plant sale. I cannot stress that enough. Um, it's a great source of, of cheap plant material. And I don't mean cheap as in dollar store cheap. I mean, it doesn't cost much and it's great restoration, great planting material. Um, I, I bought a couple hundred plants a couple years ago and replanted the NGPA by my behind my house and everything is thriving and doing wonderful. So I can't I can't plug the SCD plant cell enough um, not to undercut them, but in some cases um, the county can provide uh, plants for to landowners, but I'd, I'd encourage you to do both. Thanks, Adam. And then some people ask, we're going to combine two questions. How can you tell who owns the property adjacent to you? And then how do you know if you're, if a waterway on your property is really a stream or it's just a drainage ditch? Um, it, it's, it's, um, so um, the first question is, I would direct them to PDS map portal. If you just Google PDS map portal, again, we'll provide that in the resources follow-up. This is an online um, publicly available uh, GIS database that the county manages. 
um, that provides property information as well as critical area information. So if you're wondering if you have a mapped stream or a mapped wetland on your property, um, I didn't get into critical area site plans, but um, those are recorded on some individual parcels that have a recorded NGPA and they will call out um, what type of critical area, if it's a wetland, a stream. Um, so that's a good resource to find out um, if, you, if there's one recorded for your property. Um, PDF map portal could also potentially answer um, if you have what type of stream on your property. Um, that would be one where I would encourage the, um, if, they're, if it's not on PDF map portal, I would encourage them to reach out to me off, offline, well, out of this workshop and um, I can help address that question. Um, all my contact and Thomas's contact info is there. Um, I, I just checked before the webinar. If you just Google Adam Jackson, Snohomish County, I'm the first thing that comes up. I'm a pretty big deal, I guess. Um, and I, I didn't try it for Thomas, but I would, with that last name, I would assume that it would be pretty easy to find him um, through a Google search. Perfect. All right. Um, one other couple questions that are applicable. So we have a little bit of time. Um, someone asked, so North Creek runs through the back of their property during most of the year, the flow has stopped and now is used only during overflow times uh, during the rainy season. It has resulted in killing fish and insects, the banks are drying out and many plants are dying. When the water starts to flow, it erodes and the bank leaves, uh, there's a lot of silt in the creek, making it less deep. Can you tell me why this was done? And uh, this person said they also have a site visit scheduled, so it looks like they're getting some assistance, but. Oh, cool. Um, is there something, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a lot going on there. Um, so a, a lot of our urban streams are facing a lot of increased pressure um, from um, that flashy hydrograph that Thomas talked about, where we have increased the impervious surface um, and a lot of our storm system directs runoff straight to the, the stream. And so during the rainy seasons, you'll see the water come up really fast and it has a lot higher erosive force as it's flowing through the North Creek's channel. Um, part of that erosive force and part of that LIDAR graph, that even, even though the LIDAR uh, graphic that Thomas uh, showed um, was for the Stillaguamish, I mean, a major river, even our small creek systems are still gonna move around in that same fashion. So those increased flows could have caused North Creek to carve a channel away from your property. And now you're part of a side channel, which is actually really important habitat um, and really important for kind of relieving some of those higher flows. Um, so some of the vegetation is gonna be, you know, it evolved being more connected to the stream. And so more, a lot more moisture, a lot more water to that plant. and so. They, they could be dying for that reason. Um, erosion can be tough on, on plants as well. Um, so one solution could be to start changing over the plant community that you have on your property that's more adapted to um, a drier condition with potential um, um, seasonal flows or, or uh, you know, even event flows. So um, if you have a site visit uh, schedule, that's great. Um, and we can definitely look at um, um, some of the solutions. I don't know if it's scheduled with me or with Thomas. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. We have, how is everyone feeling for time? It's 8.33. There's a couple more questions and we could definitely follow up these folks in emails unless you all feel good about answering um, another question or so. Uh, I, I'm fine as, as long as folks um, yeah, I can stay for a couple more minutes um, for folks that have want you know more information or have further questions. I'm fine as long as you are. You're the you're the one monitoring. No worries. Yeah, I think we got a lot of things addressed, and now there it's more just uh, very site specific things. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. One person said that they have a beekeeper who has bees on their property. Um, the beekeeper said they're not getting much knotweed this year, and the honey bees. And the honey and his bees are producing um, and has been doing this for like 40 something years. He, the beekeeper's baffled. So um, they removed invasive species, 
but not a lot. So any idea why this could be this year? Have we tackled a bunch of Japanese knotweed and they're no longer flowering or what's going on? Anyone knows? I don't have a great answer. Um, it could be that there, I don't know where this area is. There could have been a focus on knotweed control um, by the county um, noxious weed agency um, or other agency that we kind of discussed on previous slides. Um, I, I wouldn't have a good answer that would be that wouldn't be wildly speculating, um, especially not knowing exactly where they are. Um, EB slew. EB slew. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, we haven't, I know the county hasn't worked on not weed control over there. Um, I don't think there's a ton over there. Um, so I, I don't have a great answer and I don't want to just speculate. Um, I know there is a beekeeper organization and if this person has been doing it for 45 years, I'm sure they're already familiar with it. Um, I don't know the name of it, but I could um, look that up and pass it along to this person if you want to take down their info. Perfect, yes. Um, and they just commented that they um, recently purchased a farm and about, you know, half have about half mile plus of F-type stream um, and could use a lot of restoration. So I'm sure they will be in contact with you and Excellent. Thomas soon. Um, but really happy. Folks are just saying thank you. Really enjoyed the information. Great. Um, yeah, and I feel like those are essentially most of the questions. Um, folks say, well done. I have a list of follow-up recommendations and resources we can send to folks for, you know, good management practices along their stream side. Um, so if anyone has any more questions, I'll keep an eye out. Yeah, I, I want to thank everybody for taking some time out and they're, they're everyone's busy um, school and work and everything. So I really appreciate everyone taking some time to um, listen in, asking great questions and just trying to educate yourself. Um, that's what myself and Thomas and the rest of the SCD staff um, and SWIM are here to do. Um, we're, we're trying to provide you guys with resources to become good stewards because we, we can't do it on our own. Um, and um, it, it takes, it ta it's going to take everybody. So thank you for your interest and thank you for attending. Yes, thank you all so much. Um, again, feel free to email Adam and Thomas. I also have an email from someone so we can follow up. Um, but thank you all again, and we will definitely be sending out an email with a link to this recording and then additional resources and information for you all to follow up on. All right. I think Thank you, there, everyone. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to end it now. So final questions. I did not see anything on Facebook. We were live on there as well. There's no questions. Yeah, just appreciate everyone's time. Um, people are really happy to get this information and just kudos to Thomas, Rob, and Adam. You all did great folks say great job. So thank you so much for all your time. Thanks, everybody. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Enjoy.